Welcome to the Grand Rounds this morning. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Pogue. He's a professor of engineering science at Dartmouth. He's uh, the director of master's and PhD prog uh, degree program in the engineering science. His optics in medicine research group develops unique spectroscopy and imaging systems that allow visualization of medically re relevant phenomena. The imaging technologies developed by this lab are used to visualize radiation therapy, guide surgery, and optimize photodynamic therapy delivery. He received his bachelor's degree from York University, majoring in physics in Canada, and he also master's degree from the same place. And he received his PhD degree from McMaster University in Canada in medical physics. And he did a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at Mass General. Uh, straight to the business, he's well-funded. <laughs> his NIH uh, reporter lists uh, him as a, a PO1 project leader and also core director, and the core name is in vivo imaging, dosimetry, and tech transfer. Uh, he also has two different other ones, <clears throat> uh, one on surgical specimen margin assessment during breast conservation surgery, and the other on uh, Cherenkov calibration for radiation therapy that just started this year. And uh, I found 239 publications listed in PubMed. He's the president and co-founder of Dose Optics, and he was dean of uh, graduate studies at Dartmouth from 2008 through 12, and he was the chair of NIH study section called uh, Biomedical Imaging Technology, BMIT study section from 2012 through 14, and he's in editorial boards of uh, five different journals, uh, including medical physics. He's the fellow of the Optical Society of America, and also he's the fellow of the um, American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. Oh, wait. Thank you. Thank you. Well, oh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, hopefully, I'll be able to show you something you haven't seen before. I think the images on this screen are hopefully something that is interesting to radiation oncology and is totally new, which is the idea of imaging radiation delivery with Cherenkov light. So you can see here a couple water tank videos and then two patient videos, one getting whole breast radiation therapy and one getting total skin electron therapy. And so the first, for the first time, we're able to visualize the uh, treatment beam as it hits the tissue. So that's what I'll, I'll talk about. I do need to disclose I am a founder and uh, president of Dose Optics, and I will have uh, about four slides on that later on in the presentation. Uh, I am at Dartmouth, which is a very small place up in New Hampshire where it's really cold right now. Um, and, uh, but we've, the engineering school invested in the Center for Imaging Medicine, so we bought a floor in the uh, Translational Research Building. And so all the engineers here are physically located in the hospital now, where we called the Center for Imaging Medicine. And uh, we work with a number of companies um, and uh, have uh, about a third of the engineering school's research budget uh, in our uh, imaging center. Uh, we do uh, a range of different things, and I won't have time to talk about them, but if you're interested, I'll just sort of mention the six sort of broad areas. We've worked for a long, long time on optical tomography, imaging through tissue with light, and integrating that into MRI, so we do breast uh, molecular imaging with light. We have worked, I have a program project grant on photodynamic therapy where we do pancreatic cancer and skin photodynamic therapy. Move along tracks, so the MRI can go into either OR, and the CT scanner can go into one of the two ORs, what we call OR2. OR2 will then enable uh, procedures that could use MRI and CT, which is very unique. In fact, it's the only facility, only operating room in the world at this time that has both MRI and CT scanning. CSI move along tracks, so the MRI can go into either OR, 
and the CT scanner can go into one of the... Uh, I'm very excited because I spent the last year of my life trying to get a CAMPEP accredited medical physics program at Dartmouth, so we just uh, are now graduating our first crop of PhDs in medical physics, uh, which uh, is uh, keeping me busy. But I, I came to Dartmouth to work uh, with some of the people in neurosurgery uh, a long time ago, and they advanced through uh, this idea of molecular guided neurosurgery, which is now everywhere. I know people here at Emory are doing this as well, of uh, fluorescence guided uh, resection of glioma tumors and potentially other types of tumors. Uh, we published a series of papers on this. We, we even built our own microscopes originally, but actually the real platform that's made this work is the Zeiss came out with their Pentero with three different fluorescence channels built in. So even just five years ago, this wasn't really possible, but today, um, you know, this is now any uh, neurosurgery department can do fluorescence-guided neurosurgery in a clinical trial. What's really emerging is uh, will this become a, an accepted paradigm? Does it change the patient outcome? And, and that's a, a point of hot debate right now. Um, one of the most recent grants I wrote was around this idea that uh, these clinical trials are good, but if they don't change the clinical outcome, you know, we, we should need to try a different agent or combination of agents. And there are thousands of uh, agents being produced. And unfortunately, what is happening is there's just a tiny little drip of them actually making it into clinical trials, which I think you could argue is actually the right thing. But if you look at the numbers, there's probably 5,000 papers per year published on different contrast agents. Uh, the clinical papers are about 200. The open clinical trials on clinicals.gov are about 10. And the, about the number of companies doing fluorescence-guided resection are about six. Uh, and this is really the problem, because to take any one of these into a phase one clinical trial costs about $10 million. And uh, that can't be afforded on NIH funding. So that is a major stopping block for uh, translation to fluorescence-guided surgery. So actually, I wrote a grant a couple years ago, which I, I think was my most interesting grant. It was completely on economics of fluorescence-guided surgery. And we said, look, um, we will not translate any of these into patients unless we find a cheaper way to do this that the NIH can fund. And so we wrote a grant and said, well, let's just follow what the nuclear medicine world has been doing for decades, which is do phase zero trials. And so small little trials where we um, limit the injected dose, and the key is you microdose. So you don't inject uh, enough to get any, anywhere near the pharmacologic doses, but just microdose. And see if the targeted molecule you care about binds to uh, the protein of interest in patients. And so we have been looking at different proteins. You can go all the way from an antibody down to an aphibody. And an aphibody is what we chose because of the penetration in tissue. And so we partnered with a company called Affibody and Lycor to make this uh, conjugate Affibody IR di 800, we call ABY029. And we are uh, introducing this into phase zero trials. And so it, it has a short lifetime, fast connects, high diffusion, and low production cost. And that is the key. Um, and so this grant uh, was, it's, we're just in the final phase of it. Now we're starting three clinical trials but it's all around the idea of small patient cohorts, microdose only, single, and that allows you to do single dose toxicity studies, rapid approval through the FDA, and low production costs. And uh, so in my mind, this is actually the only way that we will test um, new contrast agents without relying on companies to do it. And we could rely on companies to do it. There's a, there's a catch-22 economic situation, though, because there's no reimbursement, and so there's no incentive today. So we're trying to kickstart this process. So we're in the middle of this where we produce this, uh, this dye uh, through peptide synthesis, go into clinical trial, and then we're trying to iterate through a couple different uh, um, peptides. This one binds to the epidermal growth factor receptor. Uh, in the three clinical trials, we're kicking off. So we've produced our first version of the drug. We're doing a neurosurgical trial with Dave Roberts in neurosurgery a head and neck imaging trial with Joe Paydarfar in, in head and neck tumors, and then a sarcoma trial with Eric Henderson in orthopedics, uh, all with the same production run. 
And the total cost of this trial, these three trials, is less than $2 million, which is uh, a bargain basement compared to what would happen in the industrial world. So we wrote, again, this is the most interesting grant I've ever written because it's all based on economics of uh, trying to turn clinical trials into something that the NCI can actually fund. Um, so we're in the middle of this, and it's a great big experiment. Um, I will say if anybody's interested in this, uh, there's a lot of nuance to this. I firmly believe that any single agent will probably fail in this, and what we'll need to go to is uh, multiple agents. But uh, we're right in the middle of that now. What I do want to talk most of the time about is radiation therapy imaging with Cherenkov light. And so uh, what is Cherenkov? Cherenkov is uh, a little tiny light signal that's emitted from high energy electrons or charged particles. And so it comes from cosmic rays. We see it in nuclear reactors as the blue glow in the water pool. Nuclear physics uses it for particle smashing and neutrino observatories. That's the key detected signal that are in most of these fundamental particle studies. Uh, there's some great papers from the 1970s where the Apollo astronauts claimed they saw Cherenkov from blue flashes in their retina. And then a whole series of science and nature papers sort of analyzing was that really Cherenkov light. Um, there are two papers in the medical physics realm showing with uh, where they turned the lights off in the radiation therapy room and took pictures of the patient on the table and showed that there was Cherenkov light coming off the patient's head. And that was the origin of the blue light that they were seeing when, when the radiation was through their, their, their eye area. And uh, the Cherenkov, we see it as blue, but it's actually a broadband spectrum. It, it just is peaked in the UV blue, but it's actually throughout the visible spectrum. One of the interesting things we realized early on is that uh, uh, the nuclear medicine world has been using Cherenkov or playing with Cherenkov for a while. But it's a very strong, the Cherenkov emission is a very strong function of particle energy. So as you get up above 1 MV, uh, you get much, much higher emission of Cherenkov light. And so there's a threshold, and above that you get Cherenkov emission. And so in this radiation therapy regime, we get, for every um, electron in the patient, we get a couple hundred Cherenkov photons coming out. And if we do a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, there is perfect linearity between Cherenkov and dose. So from a theoretical standpoint, uh, Cherenkov emission is part of the dose delivery process. So we got into the idea of, well, uh, could we use this as a useful tool in radiation therapy dose imaging? And this was about uh, six years ago now. But we, um, our initial idea was, well, let's just image it in water tanks. And so we put a water tank under a linear accelerator beam. And these are some of the first images that we got with a specialized camera that uh, is intensified and captures single photons. And so this is a pretty poor image, but this is from a single pulse from the linear accelerator. And the linear accelerator's pulse at about 360 times per second. If we integrate and median filter 15 pulses, we actually get a pretty nice image. Um, so we built a system. Uh, Adam Glazer was a PhD student who built a system for sort of water tank gantry experimentation so we could rotate it and we could capture the beam as a dyna uh, dynamic beams. We wanted to look at both static and dynamic beams. And so this is our first video of an IMRT treatment plan in a water tank. So we're just cameras staring at the water tank. And you can see the linear accelerator is arcing around, delivering its IMRT treatment. And we're capturing real-time video of the beam as it goes through the water tank. And so it's shown in blue here. Um, and then we time integrate it to build up the Cherenkov map, or the dose map. And so we can create, in real, and, and again, this is real time. This is not processing the images 24 hours later. This is real time capture, real time video, and then real time integration to show the dose map in the water tank. So we published this in 2014. And of course, we wanted to compare it to the treatment plan. So here's the treatment plan. Here's the Cherenkov image. And we did gamma analysis using a 3%, 3 millimeter criteria, and showed that we could see a 90, greater than 95% pass rate for this type of a image. We did the same uh, treatment plan for a VMAT, 
yeah, with again, this is from TG119. It's a, a prostate, mock prostate, sort of a arc shape with a zone of low dose in the center. And both pass uh, the, uh, this 3%, 3 millimeter criteria. So it's pretty neat. It, we, we were excited about this, and we've been trying to advance this. And this is one of the, the spin offs of it. Perhaps even more interesting, though, is that it is real time. And so you can analyze the, the, the plan as a function of frames. And you can look to see where does the beam cross through the green zone, and where does the beam cross through the blue zone, and what's the dose deposition of each pot. So there's a potential tool here to help uh, inverse treatment planning uh, do a better job, or to quality, con quality audit uh, inverse treatment planning systems. So we're exploring this um, yeah, through the company. We uh, were interested in the idea of, uh, you, could we use this in situations where um, dosimetry is hard? And so we partnered with the people at Washington University who had a view ray system. We took the camera on a road trip, so you can see our camera set up on a tripod here. And view ray, of course, is a magnetic resonance guided radiation therapy uh, with three cobalt beams. So you can see the three cobalt beams here. So that tank, uh, and because it's in a magnetic field, um, you know, just the process of getting measurements out is harder and more complicated. It's not impossible, they certainly are doing it, but it's more complicated. One of the nice things about Cherenkov is we could image from across the room. We could, in principle, we could image from many, many meters away. So we positioned the camera outside the five Gauss line and just imaged the water tank down the bore of the magnet and so you'll see in the next, uh, this was about four to five meters away. Um, and so this is a sped up uh, image. And so these are three cobalt beams going into the water tank. And so you can see we capture those. This is sped up 40 times. Um, but this is the delivery of the uh, cobalt beams in the water tank. And then this is the time integrated dose map, again, for this TG119 uh, C-shaped phantom. And we're just working with the WashU group to verify this and uh, submit this for publication in medical physics. Uh, we, of course, did standard beams. So there's a nice uh, 10 centimeter square beam. And we looked at the lateral profiles and the depth dose curve. And in almost all cases, the Cherenkov does a very good job. We're seeing slight discrepancy at the smallest beams, uh, doing a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations to try to figure that out. But it's looking like this will be a useful tool for complicated situations like MR-guided radiation therapy. Um, just a couple of quick technical developments. Not, I won't get into the details, but these are important. Uh, uh, so our concept here is that we would position cameras in the room and capture uh, treatment delivery uh, for a range of possible treatments. Any, at any time, and, and perhaps even passively have it on for all patients, like uh, um, as a, you would have the video monitor on so you can see the patient, but this would allow you to see the treatment for all patients. The key is, in fact, this is the most important technical piece of it, is the linear accelerator is pulsed, and so we gate the camera to those pulses from the linear accelerator. That makes it work. That improves the uh, the gain of the system by a factor of 10,000. Uh, and uh, for the physicists in the room, uh, this is the slide that I gets me most excited, which is uh, we're using an image intensified uh, CMOS camera. And so the image intensifier is a photomultiplier tube that captures single photons, intensifies them, and then displays it. And our, our original image kind of looks like this, which kind of looks like a fuzzy glow in a snowstorm. Um, but we do a bunch of time gating to the Cherenkov pulses. We amplify. We do salt noise removal and background removal. And we take a pretty crummy image that looks like this and clean it up to look like this. And, and, and perhaps most important is this is an image made of single photons. So we're in a room like this. We're actually doing single photon imaging of light coming off the patient, which is an incredible technical achievement. Uh, and it's been taking us many years to get to the point to be able to do that. Yep? No. 
<laughs> so we've spent a, a lot of time working on that. Unfortunately, Cherenkov emission is highly energy and mass dependent. And with protons, you have to get up to about 400 MV before you get Cherenkov emission. So uh, although we've, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to measure with protons, but unfortunately. That's right. You, you, again, if you're just doing phantoms, you can turn the room lights off and you don't really have to gate. But with patients, obviously, we're looking for a system where we don't have to turn the room lights off. And that's where this has become really important, this time gating. So um, most of what I've showed you is 2D. And so we've been struggling with how could we turn this into a true 3D or 4D tool. And so this is a project that we're really right in the middle of now. Peter Bruja developed this idea of imaging with Cherenkov laterally and using the EPID or the portal beam vertically along the axial direction of the beam and combining those data streams. So you get your EPID image in real time. You get your Cherenkov image in real time. You superimpose those in real time and create a 4D uh, verification system. So we're right in the middle of this now, but this is a uh, uh, you can see this is a time-integrated uh, treatment plan of that TG119C shape. And so in real time, we capture the whole uh, 3D volume at, uh, and this, is, this was done at 10 frames per second, so it's 4D um, verification. So this is really embryonic at this point, but it's an idea that we've been playing with and uh, uh, we're developing. So, but where I want to get to, though, is imaging on patients. And so, just to show you, um, you can image on patients when we uh, position a camera up in the ceiling, whoops, uh, and we image a solid water phantom, we can, indeed can see the treatment beam. So we just made a complicated treatment plan where the, you can actually see the individual fingers or leaflets uh, of the MLC uh, moving. And so, indeed, we, what we most wanted to see is can we see an individual leaf and can we see an accident or an error in an individual leaf. And we can, we, these were two treatment plans, one that had the correct delivery and one that had a corrupted delivery in a single uh, MLC. And you, in this uh, video, which I'm not sure is playing, was the difference. But anyway, uh, so we can see submillimeter um, precision in terms of MLC positioning. And so we detected this error region right here in that uh, mock treatment plan. So in 2014, we uh, decided to kick off our first clinical trial, pilot trial, uh, imaging women who were getting whole breast radiation therapy because we realized that we could image from tissue phantoms and, um, in fact, we imaged from a whole bunch of phantoms with blood in them and even the, um, I won't get into this, but there's interesting spectroscopic implications because the color of the light that comes out is affected by the blood oxygenation. Uh, but anyway, light comes out of tissue, and it's largely near infrared to red. So in 2014, we kicked off our first uh, pilot trial, imaging uh, 12 women who were getting whole breast radiotherapy. And this is the very first patient we imaged. Uh, and you can, see, you, you can see her breathing. You can see, so a couple interesting things. You can clearly see the outline of the beam on the chest. Um, and this was uh, interesting to us. You, you can see the blood vessels in the breast because they are absorbing the Cherenkov light. And uh, so from one aspect, that's unfortunate because it means the tissue optical properties affect the image, and it's not going to be just directly proportional to dose. But you can also think of these as sort of biological fiducial markers that actually are a way to uh, verify that the beam is in the right spot every time. So those are some of the ideas we've been playing with. But this is, uh, every time I present this, I am a little taken aback because I realize this is the first time ever that anybody has been able to image radiation delivery in tissue. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm excited, to <laughs> let me put it that way. Um, we imaged this patient. She got a standard plan where she had six MV treatment and a 10 MV treatment and then two boost beams. And uh, these are uh, dynamic wedge coming in here. You can see, I'll just let this cycle through, but you can see that, uh, you can see the treatment plan for all the different beams. Um,
and uh, let me see if I can. Okay, oops. There, uh, this is the video set of videos for uh, the 12 patients. Um, putting 12 videos on a slide is always a precarious <coughs> thing to do, but uh, so you can see the, diff the 12 different beams are all dynamic. We captured real-time video of all the uh, beams, and, and the shape of delivery matches the shape of the plan. Oops. And um, so we're still in the process of analyzing this data, but if we uh, take a single uh, 6 MV beam, for example, and match the Cherenkov to the predicted surface dose, we see a linear map between dose and Cherenkov, uh, averaged over the whole breast. Um, and then if we just look at it as a function of time in terms of monitor units delivered, uh, the Cherenkov intensity is perfectly linear with the uh, monitor units delivered. So that's been pretty exciting. Um, the other thing we explored was this idea that because we see those blood vessels, we could do image recognition, pick out the blood vessels, and track them over time. And so for a patient that was doing a breath hold treatment, we actually see a nice flat line in terms of the movement of the blood vessels. It, for a patient who is free breathing, we can track the blood vessels and track the motion and, and be able to capture the motion in real time uh, again, remotely from the Cherenkov camera. And so uh, we, we are, uh, we've gotten into this process of uh, commercial translation. And the, the camera system we used costs $80,000 for a single camera. Um, making two in a room would be $160,000. And the software was research grade software. So we spun off a company with our Dartmouth's backing and uh, d with the goal of making cost-effective cameras, custom software for radiation therapy, and packaging it for clinical trials. And that's Dose Optics, and that company has been funded by three SBAR grants now. And uh, there's the main people involved in the company, uh, largely from the engineering school at Dartmouth. Uh, our first installation at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center was in April, and so you can see the camera up here on the wall. This was a joint partnership with Vision RT, so we're installing it, uh, capturing the Vision RT image in real time as we capture our Cherenkov image uh, on the patient's tissue. And so here is one of the first patients. We've done two so far, uh, but you can see this is the Cherenkov image. As, it, as, you, as the camera actually sees it with, a, with almost no signal processing. This is the um, entrance side, exit side, and then the other beam, here's the entrance side and exit side. And so you can clearly see um, the beam lines uh, on the patient's tissue, and you can clearly also see the blood vessels and other biological markers on their skin. Um, what we've been working on is importing the, the dynamic log file uh, and displaying the Cherenkov image superimposed on the surface from the, from the um, uh, CT scan and, and then displaying that beside the planned dose. So here's the planned dose or planned beam delivery with the, you can see the MLCs here and here's the Cherenkov image. These two videos are slightly out of sync but uh, so you can see we're, I think the, the goal we're working on is can we do verification uh, for these patients. Um, one of the interesting treatments, we captured a single MLC, so the system is sensitive enough to capture a single MLC slice on a patient's skin. Uh, we're working on cranking the sensitivity of the camera up slightly to better delineate this, but indeed you can see the shape of the beam and capture things as, as small as a single MLC leaf. Uh, and so this is the current user interface. We're just about to enter our first clinical trial at Dartmouth um, in probably a month or so uh, where we display to the, to the radiation therapy staff, uh, treatment therapy people, uh, the live Cherenkov, the cumulative Cherenkov, uh, the treatment plan, and then the cumulative plan as it's happening. Um, we're still going back and forth, I would say, with what's the right display software to make it maximally useful to the radiation therapy team. Uh, 
Um, one of the things that we are struggling with, but we know is probably important, is uh, capturing the patient's body, the surface map of the patient's body as it moves, and superimposing the Cherenkov on that so that we really display what is going on with the patient. Uh, Vision RT, I assume people here are familiar with Vision RT, captures the surface map of the patient and so they get an estimate of where the body position is. Uh, we can superimpose on that the Cherenkov image, but we need to be able to use the Vision RT map to superimpose. And um, they only get a partial map, so we're, we've been trying to, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, we've been trying to display that on the uh, patient tissue and uh, uh, I don't know if you saw this video which I'm having struggle, struggling with to play, but the beam was wandering on the patient's tissue there, and that's because of her breathing. Uh, th this is kind of a reverse, though. We've moved the beam on the CT scan. What we need to do is display the CT scan as she was really positioned with the static beam. But you can see this is not a static treatment. This is a dynamic treatment where it's modified by the patient's uh, movement. And that's what we're trying to capture in real time for the therapy team. Uh, last uh, clinical trial or pilot trial I'll show you is we got into total skin electron therapy. This was really interesting for us because we saw something that we think was clinically significant for the first time. Uh, so this is where patients stand in six different poses, the Stanford poses to and are delivered uh, electron therapy to their total skin surface. You can look at this patient right here, and one of the things you immediately notice is that the hands and especially the feet are colder than the rest of the body. And uh, that's not a surprise, but they're significantly colder than the rest of the body. And so we did a bunch of TLD measurements where we taped TLDs onto the patient uh, on many different sites and indeed uh, found that the dose to the uh, wrist and to the calf was significantly lower than they were expecting. Um, uh, Jacqueline Andriozzi is a grad student in our group. She did a detailed analysis of this on three different subjects and found, in fact, that we were underdosing, you know, the, the beam angles we were using were not correct. And so she won the Young Investigator Award at the American Association of Physicists and Medicine last year. Um, 2016 for recognizing this and, and, and to me this is an illustration of you can think you're doing the right thing but if you don't have the right tool to measure it you don't know unless you take a picture or an image you don't really know and so we're now we've uh, published a paper in medical physics where we shifted the angles that we use for the beam and uh, most importantly, depending on which room you're in and the, which machine you use, you need a slightly different set of angles. Uh, and, and there's even some reports now suggesting that the uh, floor material that are in the room would affect the dose at the lower end because of electrons scattering off the floor. So we're, we're looking into that. So we, in that paper, there's a prescription for angle spread versus SSD. Uh, between the patient and the machine. Oops. Uh, so th th I'm going to summarize a little bit now and uh, before I just show you one last little snippet. I recognize this is very embryonic technology in radiation therapy. And the strengths of it, though, are that it's a real-time video of the delivery. Um, it is, some, it is related to and captures patient position and delivery integrated together, and then has the potential for very large fields of view. You know, that are the, those are the strengths of radiation therapy imaging. The weaknesses are that it's just surface imaging. Uh, there are tissue corrections needed. We're working on this. And it's a single 2D view of the patient or the water tank. Uh, but the opportunities that we've been looking at, and I, I welcome other ideas where this technology could have value, is in dynamic imaging, uh, 4D Cherenkov EPID, the symmetry of water tanks, MRI radiation therapy. Those, those are the areas that we think uh, make a lot of sense. And then the opportunities for uh, beam delivery verification in patients are things like soft tissue imaging and mapping. Breast, head, and neck are the two uh, pilot trials we've tried and total skin electron therapy is the other trial. Um, 
we are interested and very interested in future clinical trials, uh, things like verify, verify the delivery accuracy and fractionated radiation therapy. This is probably what the company will pursue, which is the idea of can we just verify that every fraction is the same. Uh, and this is passive and doesn't need to be turned on and so it could be done without any intervention from the radiation therapy team. That's perhaps the most important thing. Um, we're also interested in working with Vision RT about confirming the value of patient surface mapping tools. Um, <clears throat> combining surface mapping with Cherenkov for delivery verification, total electron therapy, and uh, potentially is this <clears throat> the type of thing that will help incident reporting, which is real-time capture of every treatment all the time. Uh, and just, I'm just going to end with uh, two fun slides. Uh, we got involved in this work and now have some funding to do molecular imaging and radiation therapy with this idea that uh, Cherenkov light is light generated inside the tissue or inside the patient. So we, could we use that light where we inject the light through the radiation beam to do molecular imaging of a patient? And so this is the idea is we take a thin sheet of illumination of radiation and we sweep it up and down through an animal. And when that sheet strikes areas of uh, fluorophore, that gets captured, the fluorescence gets captured by the uh, camera. This is actually fascinating and is directly parallel to light sheet microscopy. If you're into the microscopy world, uh, they won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for light sheet microscopy where they section through specimens with a light sheet. We're doing light sheet uh, imaging with a radiation therapy machine. Uh, so here's the idea. Uh, we've got a rat on the table. We do a cone beam CT to capture its uh, bone structures, and then we do um, radiation therapy vertically and capture the Cherenkov light to the side. The X-rays induce Cherenkov. The Cherenkov then excites luminescence from any molecular probe in the tissue. And so we work with Sergei Vinogradov at U UPenn that makes these oxygen-sensitive dyes that absorb in the UV blue and emit in the near infrared. Uh, and this is the highest resolution molecular imaging possible. We can achieve 0.1 millimeter spatial resolution in the micro uh, molar concentration range. So we're actually, we published this in a couple optics letters papers, uh, but we, I believe that this will be the highest spatial resolution because we can define it by the uh, step size of an MLC. And the step size of a multi-leap collimator is 0.1 millimeters. So we did uh, some studies in rats where we looked at uh, 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 oxygen-sensitive phosphor in a tumor, and there's the reconstructed image. We illuminated with a five millimeter beam. We raster scanned that beam up and down in 0.1 millimeter movements. We deconvolved the beam thickness, the attenuation correction, and we showed that we could image a single lymph node in a rat or image uh, the oxygen's, uh, oxygenation of a tumor in this other rat model. Um, so, we, uh, because a radiation therapy beam can be extremely wide, we also showed that we can image three animals at once. And so, this is where it gets very interesting because you can imagine raster scanning a beam through patient, for example, to do molecular sensing. Uh, oops. And so, this was three animals taped down on a table with tumors at different locations and imaging all simultaneously. So I'll end there uh, and just say, um, you know, this idea of Cherenkov light imaging is readily done with the room lights on. The key, the technical key is the time gating and background noise suppression. Uh, human dose delivery imaging uh, captures dynamics. It has the potential to be always on. It's sensitive down to a single MLC, and we can overlay the image on the anatomy or the plan. Um, we think there's been a lot of interest in total skin electron therapy. I realize this is not a common uh, uh, delivery uh, procedure, but it's one where the dosimetry is particularly problematic. And so it's good for large area field of treatment, and uh, we've done some discovery of the non-optimal angles. We are interested in trying to turn Cherenkov images into calibrated dose image. Uh, this is work that's ongoing in the lab, and we are 
have been on this pathway to translate it through uh, dose optics into a system that will be hopefully available to the radiation th therapy world more broadly fairly soon. And then this idea of molecular imaging with scanned radiation sheets is, again, uh, at the laboratory level, but really I find scientifically interesting. So uh, the people who uh, have done most of this work are David Gladstone, head of medical physics, Leslie Jarvis, radiation oncologist, and Colleen Fox, another medical physicist. And we've uh, had some great collaboration from uh, Jorg at Harvard and Olga and Harold at WashU and uh, the people at Dose Optics and some uh, terrific PhD students here. So thank you.